Thank you. I will call the assembly meeting on education. Um, Ms. Secretary, Madam Secretary, will you please call the roll? Assemblywoman Duran? Here. Assemblywoman Flores? Present. Assemblywoman Gorlo? Here. Assemblywoman <clears throat> Hansen? Here. Assemblywoman Hardy? Here. Assemblywoman Krasner? Here. Assemblywoman Marzola? Here. Assemblyman MacArthur? Here. Assemblywoman Miller? Here. Assemblywoman Nguyen? Here. Assemblywoman Tolls? Here. Assemblywoman Torres? Here. Chair Bill Bray Axelrod? Here, and we have all members present, so we do have a quorum. Welcome to those of you meeting, uh, watching the meeting online or on YouTube and those participating by phone or video. Just a couple housekeeping things before we get started. If you haven't done so already, please mute your microphone when you're not speaking as to minimize background noise. I know we have been having some uh, internet and Zoom issues up in the capital city. So um, please bear with us if we lose members and have them join again. Um, I think our uh, research assistant is by phone right now and frantically racing to get to the Sedway office to be able to be there for us. So um, we, you know, sign of the times. Committee members, when possible, keep your cameras on so we can ensure a quorum. And we do expect courtesy and respect in this committee. We don't always agree on policy, but we do need to be respectful to each other in the legislative process. Reminder, you can find all meeting materials for, at the, uh, for this meeting at the committee's website on Nellis. And for those of you watching online in this virtual world, um, many of us do have several screens that we'll be looking at. So if we are looking away, please don't consider that a sign of disrespect. We're likely just looking at meet, uh, meeting um, exhibits or the bill itself. Today, we have four bills this afternoon and we are going to take them out of order. We're gonna start with AB 420, then to AB 417, AB 231, and last but not least, AB 261. Um, we, for the bill hearings, I have allocated equal time in support, opposition, and neutral. Each person testifying is allowed a maximum of two minutes. Staff will time each speaker to ensure everyone is given an equal opportunity to speak. And speakers are urged to avoid repetition of comments made by previous speakers. So if they say exactly what you wanted to say, you can say ditto and we will get the drift. Um, if you wish to testify and you have not done so already, please register through the online link um, that's provided on the agenda. Upon successful registration, you'll receive a telephone number, meeting ID and instructions for joining the meeting. So that we have accurate information Please do not share this link, but encourage others to sign up as well. Uh, you all also may submit public comments in writing, either in lieu of um, or in addition to testifying. Members of the committee may request testifiers to submit documentation to support their testimony. Uh, the hearing on AB 420, I am going to be presenting, so I will pass the virtual gavel to Vice Chair Miller. And with that, Vice Chair Miller, take it away. All right, thank you, Chair. Um, with that, we can go ahead and open the hearing on AB 420. Presented, it is a bill uh, presented from the actual um, Committee on Education in the Assembly, and it's an act relating to education, revising provisions relating to educational management organizations and providing other matters there too. So with that, Chair, we are ready when you are. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Miller. Um, uh, first, I, I'm Shannon Bilbray Axwad for the record. I represent Assembly District 34 in Clark County. And this afternoon, I have the distinct honor of pre uh, presenting Assembly Bill 420 for your consideration. Um, this bill changes the name of the entity that provides certain to certain charter schools. Actually, that was the intent of the bill. That bill, this bill does not do that anymore. <laughs> um, so if you would refer to the amendment, the conceptual amendment on Nellis, and you can follow along there, it's not 
as you see, the, the bill wasn't very complicated and it's still not very complicated. I would never say it was simple because we know that that's the, the curse of death, right? So here's where the impetus came from. When you hear the phrase educational management organization or EMO, it sounds like that organization manages the school. However, these companies are really providing, they're, they're a service provider, they're a vendor, and they are accountable to the governing body of that charter school that chooses to contract with them. Section 388A.030 of NRS defines an educational management or organization for a for-profit corporation, business organization, or any other entity that provides service relating to operating or management of a charter school, which is really, really broad and open and, and quite frankly, open to misinterpretation. Um, I found this when I started chairing this committee and had kind of heard the term, but wasn't exactly sure what it meant. And the more I asked, the more I found from people that they all had a different sort of interpretation of what it was. So. The bill is written, revises the definition of EMOs by renaming the educational management organization as educational service providers to better reflect how they serve the charter school. That's what I thought would be the simplest. I thought it would make it very clear. Well, it's NRS, so nothing's ever simple, right? Um, however, there's a proposed amendment to this bill, which is available on Nellis, as I mentioned, for two primary reasons. First, because at both the national and local level, the term, the for-profit term educational management organization and its nonprofit counterpart term charter management organization are commonly used and understood. Deviating could cause confusion when working with both national and local partners. Second, implementing the change in terminology would cause extensive work and a fiscal note. So therefore, um, the proposed amendment retains the term educational management organization, but that instead clarifies and tightens the definition to better reflect what these entities are and the purpose they serve. As you can see in the proposed amendment, it would be defined as a for-profit for entity that contracts with a governing body of a charter school to provide centralized support or operations, including without limitations to educational, administrative, management, compliance, or instructional service to that charter school. So that really concludes my remarks. And um, I think this captures it. I'm open to questions and um, we, you know, we're kind of forced to put this together. So I'm hoping that this uh, kind of covers everything, but I'm looking forward to input of the members as well, so. Thank open for, for that. And with that, we'll open it up for questions. Members, do we have any questions? I don't see any questions. They're letting me off easy. <laughs> you may have been correct. This may have been a very easy bill. We'll see. Um, so with that, with, seeing no questions broadcasting, can we open up the lines? for um, anyone wishing to test support of AB 420? Of course, Vice Chair, thank you. To testify in support on Assembly Bill 420, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Just wanna remind anyone um, testifying that you will have two minutes and please state your name fully, a uh, first and last name for the record. Once again, to testify in support on Assembly Bill 420, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Vice Chair, at this time, we have no callers in the queue to testify in support on Assembly Bill 420. Okay, can we open up the line for um, all of those, anyone in opposition? Because I in opposition on Assembly Bill 420, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue.
once again to testify in opposition on Assembly Bill 420. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Vice Chair, at this time, there are no callers in the queue to provide testimony on opposition to Assembly Bill 420. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I'm expecting then obviously many people to um, testify in neutral. So can we open the line for anyone testifying in neutral? Testify in neutral on Assembly Bill 420. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. To testify in the neutral position on Assembly Bill 420, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Vice Chair, at this time, the line is open and working. However, we have no callers to testify in the neutral position on Assembly Bill 420. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Chair Bill Bray Axelrod, three sessions in education, and I've never seen, I wish I would have started my timer for this bill hearing, but would you like to make any closing remarks? Yeah, I just have about 30 minutes of closing remarks. <laughs> no, um, no, I thank you, and and I I really am I'm serious about this since the bill is amended. Take a look at this, um, committee members, and if you think that any way that I have not in Incorporated exactly. I, I really want this definition to be clear. So um, if offline, if you think of something and think like, oh, that should have been in there too, please. Uh, we we have a we have all the time in the world. No, we don't. We have a week. But um, so thank you. Thank you for hearing it. And uh, that's it. Thank you. With that, I will uh, quickly close the hearing on AB 420 and hand the gavel back over to Chair Bill Bray Axelrod. Thank you, Vice Chair. All right, moving on. I think this one is going to be a pretty quick one as well. So now with that, we will open the hearing on AB 417 uh, presented by our very own Assemblywoman Tolls. And let's see, what's it say? It's about school buses, but I don't see that in my comment, in my notes. So. Go ahead, Assemblywoman Tolls, when you're ready. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thanks, members of this committee. My name is Assemblywoman Jill Tolls, for the record. I represent Assembly District 25. I'm here to represent or to present Assembly Bill 417, and uh, which the changes, uh, the way issues identified during school bus inspections are reported and addressed. Briefly, Nevada Departments of Education. Nevada's Department of Education submitted a recommendation at the final meeting and work session of the Interim Legislative Committee on Education concerning school bus inspections. Section 386.830 of the Nevada Revised Statutes requires the Department of Public Safety to inspect each school bus two times annually and make recommendations regarding defects identified to the superintendent of schools of each district. The superintendent must ensure defects are addressed within 10 days of receipt or be guilty of a misdemeanor and upon conviction of such may be removed from office. Testimony presented to the members of the interim committee indicated that reports concerning school bus inspections needed to be delivered to the district. Personnel responsible for ensuring the safety of school buses as quickly as possible. Nevada's Department of Education requested that a designee of the superintendent be the responsible party for obtaining the report and carrying out needed repairs. The department also requested additional clarity can be, be provided concerning the written recommendations so that district staff would receive the recommendations and inspection report at the same time. These changes were requested to ensure the safety of each district's school bus fleet. Madam Chair, at this time, I would like to bring your attention to the amendment that was submitted by NDE yesterday. It's on Nellis. You will find a document titled AB 17 proposed amendment, as well as a document titled AB 417 bill draft request 
for the Legislative Committee on Education, August 20. The first document is the amendment the department is requesting now to reflect requested changes to the bill before you today. While the second document is a copy of the recommended recommendation NDE submitted to the Legislative Committee on Education for your reference. It is my understanding that NDE is requesting to amend the bill as follows. Number one, reduce the frequency of school bus inspections from semi-annual to annual, add language requiring the reinspection of vehicles that receive a notice of violation, increase, number two, increase from 10 to 20 the number of days to correct a bus defect, Number three, restore and repeal language regarding a superintendent's potential removal from office following the conviction of a misdemeanor. And finally, number four, require an annual report for the Department of Public Safety to each district and charter school on the health and safety of a fleet. Madam Chair, this concludes my presentation of Assembly Bill 417. It is my understanding that staff from NDE, let's hope, is available to answer any questions you may have regarding the bill. Yes, they are. Thank you, Assemblywoman Tolls, for um, presenting the bill. Um, so I'm sure we have some questions from committee. I'm looking at everyone's hands, but I will go ahead and start out with a question. And my question is on the amendment. And I'm, I'm guessing that the amendment changing it from semi-annual to annual is probably a budgetary concern, I, I'm guessing, but um, could I get some clarification on that? Um, I do sort of feel like this was pretty well thought out and I know we just had another school bus accident, um, you know, recently, I think it was today actually. So, um, you know, just something to be concerned about, but if, if Andy wants to, to discuss the amendment, I would appreciate that. Thank you, Chair. Felicia Gonzalez, for the record, from the Nevada Department of Education. I'm glad to um, answer that question. So the language was changed to annually because of the addition of the Department of Public Safety shall reinspect vehicles, um, which have received a violation after the defect, defect is corrected. So that, that frees up um, DPS staff from having to do two inspections per year of every district's fleet. It now, it now reduces down to one inspection per year so that they now have the time to do re-inspection of any buses that, that do have a violation. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, and I, I appreciate that. My other uh, concern, and this is probably just because I've been on judiciary uh, this, this session, um, the within 10 days to within 20 days, are we calling those calendar days? Are we calling them business days? I think that we should probably spell that out. That's in subsection A. Thank you, Felicia Gonzalez for the record. Um, yes, that was something that we discussed and we would be happy to do that. Okay, and do you know what the intent is? Business days. 20 business days, okay, so, okay. Um, so that's over to, okay. That seems a little long to me, I'm going to be honest, but, um, I'll, I'll, I'll let other members ask questions. I'm looking, I'm looking. No questions. I have a question. Assembly win win. I, I don't know if you'd consider this. I know that most of the court system is going towards uh, calendar days. I don't know if that's something that you would contemplate in that just because I know that across the state we're trying to move to calendar days. I don't know if that is the same within the education system, but I would just put that out there. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say I feel much more comfortable with that uh, 20 calendar days because that is obviously over two weeks two full weeks. I know that was your, but then you have the extra days as well. Um, so we can t discuss this offline, but I think that, and I think just for, because of, um, we'd like to see NRS be consistent. So, um, and we, we can talk offline, Ms. Gonzalez, if you'd like. 
Okay, any other questions from committee? I have one chair. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, my question is, and again, I'm bouncing between uh, the bill, but looking at the amendment. Um, so when we're talking about it, that the superintendent of a school district could be guilty of a misdemeanor and upon conviction be removed from office for not responding to have uh, defects on a bus fixed. So do we have a definition of defect? Because I mean, not all, de of course, some defects will can can lead to loss of and, and, and just severe negligence, but um, not all defects are necessarily so do we have a definition of what a defect is? I certainly wouldn't want to see a superintendent convicted or removed from office for, you know, a late oil change or paint that's rusting off, you know, the bumper or something like that. Can we, can you define defect for us, please? Yes, thank you for the question. Felicia Gonzalez for the record, um, Department of Education. Yes, um, uh, all violations or um, or things that could um, take a, a bus out of service are defined in a out of service criteria manual that is that is made public on the Department of Public Safety website and is provided to every school district um, director of transportation. Okay, and so we're only referring to those those defects that say this bus cannot drive anymore. Like this bus is out of commission until it gets fixed. Felicia Gonzalez, for the record, that is correct. Okay. And uh, thank you, thank you, Vice Chair, for that. And I'm going to ask um, our legal counsel if perhaps we should once again write that into the amendment so that is clear. Once again, that's kind of a it's a pretty stiff penalty uh, to the superintendent if you know if there's room for interpretation. But Amanda, could you weigh in on that? <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Amanda Marissa, Committee Council. Yes, we can certainly add a definition of um, defect or inspection issue uh, through the amendment as well. That would just be a, a policy decision for the committee. Yeah, and if we just did it pursuant to what uh, Ms. Gonzalez said, uh, I I forgot what you just said, but if we could just make put that verbiage in there, so we would you know the bill wouldn't have to become I don't know how long that is, but we just wrote pursuant to those that definition I think that would probably be okay but you're you're our you're our uh, lawyer so not me um I, I uh, think yeah. I, so go ahead all right uh Amanda Murphy Committee Council again I was just gonna say we can just refer to those standards within the definition perfect thank you and uh, Assemblywoman Torres Thank you, Chair, for the question. And thank you, Assemblyman Tolls, for the presentation. Um, so I guess my question is, um, I noticed that in this legislation, it doesn't um, describe what would occur if like a driver or the school district feels that there's perhaps something that might need to be re-inspected, right? Like uh, there, there's some type of technical or mechanical problem with the vehicle, um, and they decide that it, it probably needs to be looked at. So would the re-inspection, um, occur again because I, I I think then that that the Department of Public Safety should reinspect the vehicle after it has had maybe any type of like extreme mechanic work. Maybe the engine stops working, right? And then they replace it. So that would be maybe a cause for the Department of Public Safety to reinspect the vehicle. Has there been a conversation or a dialogue about perhaps having that vehicle reinspected? Felicia Gonzalez, um, for the record, um, there is nothing that would stop a district from um, from pulling their own bus out of service and requesting um, requesting a reinspection from the Department of Public Safety. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Um, up your hand if you have one. I have a hard time with chat, so I'm better with hands on. Okay, I am not seeing any. So with that, we will go to callers. Oh, do we, do we have anyone on Zoom that wanted to testify? I know we have a lot of people on Zoom, but if you do, you can turn on your camera. I don't believe so. So why don't we go ahead to the phones and I will open up 
testimony and support for AB 417 and DPS. Go ahead with the first caller. To testify in support on Assembly Bill 417, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Once again, if you wish to testify in support on Assembly Bill 417, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. There, the line is open and working. However, there are no callers to testify in support of Assembly Bill 417 at this time. Thank you very much, PPS. So I, with that, I will close uh, testimony in support and move to testimony in opposition. To testify in opposition on Assembly Bill 417, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once again, if you wish to testify in opposition on Assembly Bill 417, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Here, the public line is open and working. There are no callers to testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 417 at this time. Thank you, BPS. I will close the testimony in opposition and open it to neutral. To testify in neutral on Assembly Bill 417, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Once again, to testify in neutral on Assembly Bill 417, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the line is open and working. However, we have no callers to testify in neutral on Assembly Bill 417. Thank you, BPS and uh, Assemblywoman Tolls. You're giving me a run for the, my money on uh, the speediness of the bill. Did you have any closing remarks? I do not, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. And thank you, Committee, for hearing this bill and for your thoughtful questions. Thank you. Ms. Gonzalez, did you want to say anything in closing? Uh, Felicia Gonzalez, for the record, um, no, thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to um, be here to provide um, support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you for testifying. And um, with that, I'll close the hearing on AB 217, and I will open the hearing for AB 231. AB 231 revises provisions governing education on the Holocaust and other genocides. We have Assemblywoman Cohen. Here, welcome to the Committee on Education and please begin when you're ready. Thank you, Chair Bill Bray Axelrod and committee uh, for hearing this bill. And thank you to the coalition who have been working on it for some time and also to Assemblywoman Krasner and Lieutenant Governor Marshall for working on this legislation with me. And I should say I'm Leslie Cohen representing Assembly District 29. Um, so to get right into it, why is this bill necessary? In 1989, this legislature created the Governor's Advisory Council on Education relating to the Holocaust. Uh, however, when you review that legislation, you see that it's got very little guidance um, set out in the statute for the council. Over the years, that wasn't uh, much of a problem because Nevada's had hundreds of Holocaust survivors who live here who would uh, tell their stories. And they would share with students how hundreds of years of anti-Semitism and the loss of democratic principles in Nazi Germany culminated in a horror, the likes of which the world never saw before and thankfully hasn't seen since. And um, just to put this in perspective, there's just something really amazing that happens when students uh, from grade school to high school meet with survivors. There's a bond that's formed and those students see how acts of racism and xenophobia impact communities and how those students have themselves have a duty to stand up for what is right in the world. Um, these meetings change students in a good way. Uh, for instance, in 2020, um, a survey from Echoes and Reflection shows that education is the key to combating hate. In this survey, college students who reported having received Holocaust education in high school were more likely to recognize 
the dangers, dangers of anti-Semitism, stand up for those who are being discriminated against, and stop something similar from happening again to anyone. Uh, but not everyone gets that education. A recent national survey of Holocaust knowledge among American millennials reported, among other significant findings, that almost half of millennials believe that fewer than 2 million Jewish people were killed in the Holocaust. That misunderstanding of what the Holocaust is, is particularly disturbing when considering how anti-Semitism is impacting our communities. In 2019, the FBI reported that Jews and Jewish institutions were the overwhelming target of religious uh, religion-based hate crimes in 2018, um, as they have been every year since 1991. And however, as the Anti-Defamation League has stated, better understanding of the Holocaust is not only important for fighting anti-Semitism, it's also important for, fi for, hiding, for fighting hate against all marginalized communities. Uh, today, hate crimes and anti-Semitic incidents are at historically high levels. And unfortunately, as time goes by, we're losing our survivors and teachers are left with little guidance on how to teach this overwhelming and emotional subject. Uh, but we must teach it because the world is forgetting. Today, much of the evidence we have about the horrors of the Holocaust we have because General Dwight D. Eisenhower feared that if he did not save the evidence, that later generations would not understand and believe the extent of the depravity. According to General Eisenhower, quote, but the most interesting, although horrible sight that I encountered during the trip was a visit to a German internment camp, camp near Gotha. The things I saw beggar description, the visual evidence and the verbal testimony of starvation, cruelty and bestiality were overpowering. I made the visit deliberately in order to be in a position to give firsthand evidence of these things, if ever in the future, there develops a tendency to charge these allegations merely to propaganda, end quote. But in that same letter, General Eisenhower even noticed, noted how General George Patton was overwhelmed by what they saw. According to General Eisenhower, quote, in one room where they um, there were piled up 20 or 30 naked men killed by starvation, George Patton would not even enter. He said he would get sick if he did so, end quote. And General Eisenhower was correct. We do see that denial is happening. And as you'll hear, even in our state, even among unfortunately teachers when teaching the Holocaust. Um, and, and so just to go to basics, what exactly was the Holocaust? The Holocaust, also known as the Shoah, was the genocide of European Jews during World War II. Between 1941 and 1945, Nazi Germany and its collaborators systematically murdered some 6 million Jews across German-occupied Europe um, and that was around two, -third of, two thirds of European Jews and 90% of Polish Jews. The murders were carried out in pogroms and mass shootings by a policy of extermination through work in concentration camps and in gas chambers and gas vans in German extermination camps. Uh, but there were 5 million others who were victims of the Nazis uh, because of who they were, who they loved, what they thought or for having disabilities. According to Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center, numerous people fell victim to the Nazi regime for political, social, or racial reasons. Germans were among the first victims persecuted because of their political activities. Many died in concentration camps, uh, but most were released after their spirits were broken. Uh, Germans with mental or physical handicaps were killed in, in what was euphemistically called a euthanasia program. Other Germans were incarcerated for being homosexuals, criminals, or nonconformists. And these people, although treated brutally, were never slated for utter annihilation the way the Jews were. The Roma and Sinti, who are often um, referred to by the derogatory term of gypsies, were murdered by the Nazis in large numbers. Estimates range from 200,000 to over 500,000 victims. Nazi policy toward the Roma and the Sinti were inconsistent. And then the people of Poland, Russia, the Ukraine, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, and Bulgaria were also deemed racially inferior by the Nazis. Yet it was not um, racial ideology alone that determined how the Nazis treated these particular ethnic groups. Um, and, and though the Poles, uh, for example, were treated terribly, the plans were not to target them for complete annihilation. 
Um, so with that, uh, we've got a few people to speak and I know our time is short. So um, I will just thank you for hearing this bill again and, and turn it over to Assemblywoman Krasner. Good afternoon, Chair Bill Bray Axelrod and members of the Assembly Education Committee. For the record, I am Nevada State Assemblywoman Lisa Krasner representing District 26. The Holocaust was not the first genocide and sadly it was not the last, but it was the first time genocide had been carried out in such a systematic and carefully orchestrated manner. The enormity of the evil of 6 million Jewish people, gay people and persons with disabilities and others murdered because of their identity was an atrocity. The numbers themselves are incomprehensible. The extent of collective human cruelty and the utter failure of morality could not be imagined were they not among the best documented historical facts. But even while we struggle to understand the ethical imperative of never again is crystal clear. We must never allow what happened to the Jewish people to ever happen again in history. And that is why Holocaust education is so important. And that is why we never must forget the Holocaust. As time passes, memory fades. A Pew study released in 2020 indicates that millennials know less about the Holocaust than previous generations. The Anti-Defamation League's most recent global poll determined that only an estimated 54% of the entire world population has ever even heard of the Holocaust. And others think that it's not important anymore. This comes at a time when hate crimes and violence against minorities and marginalized community, communities are up across the country, especially during the pandemic, as we saw two weeks ago in Atlanta. Matching this trend of hate, incidents of anti-Semitism remain alarmingly high. According to the Anti-Defamation League, there were over 1,500 anti-Semitic incidents in 2020 alone. And hate is getting more violent too, as we've seen over the past few years in Charlottesville and Pittsburgh, in Poway and El Paso, in Jersey City, and now in Atlanta extremists feel emboldened to act out their hate against Jewish people and other groups. The connection between the Holocaust knowledge gap and the rise in incidents of hate is clear, but so is the solution, education. The importance of Holocaust education was underscored in a survey conducted last fall by Echoes and Reflections. Key findings of that study included Students with Holocaust education are more open to differing viewpoints, which includes being more comfortable with people of different races or different sexual orientations. They are also significantly more likely to report a willingness to challenge incorrect or biased information and challenge intolerant behavior in others and stand up to negative stereotyping. This is why we must provide more resources for and improve Holocaust and genocide education in Nevada schools. AB 231 will require the state to create a fund that individuals and organizations can donate to, which educators in Nevada can use as a resource to enhance their Holocaust and genocide education programs. Additionally, AB 231 will create a subcommittee where the three nonprofit organizations that lead Holocaust and genocide education in Nevada, the Holocaust Governor's Council and the Department of Education can come together and work together on best practices and ways to improve Holocaust and genocide education curriculum and programming. Holocaust education is instrumental in fighting hate. We must all work together to prevent the prejudice and discrimination that leads to atrocities like the Holocaust by teaching Holocaust education. I would appreciate your support on AB 231. Thank you. 
Thank you, Assemblywoman Krasner. And I believe you have somebody else testifying for you. I will let you know that you guys are at 11 minutes and I know we have a, a lot of people in the queue to testify. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, this is Lieutenant Governor Kate Marshall. And thank you, Chair Bilbrey Axelrod and members of the committee for allowing me to speak before you this afternoon. Um, I want to thank Assemblywoman Cohen and Krasner for their leadership on this matter. Um, I cannot, under the rules of the legislature, be a co-sponsor, um, but I am in full support of AB 231, and I didn't want to miss the opportunity to weigh in because of my own family's personal experience. My daughter's grandmother uh, is a Holocaust survivor, and so as a family, we are deeply invested in making sure that those lessons from the Holocaust and from other genocides, such as the Armenian genocide, are taught in a respectful and factually accurate manner for this generation and for generations to come. Today, their grandmother receives reparations from the country of Austria. And even recently, I don't know, in the last two months, um, my, on my, uh, their dad's side of the family, uh, they have received letters from the uh, German government and the Austrian government acknowledging uh, the actions uh, of the Holocaust and um, offering um, services and other things because of the role of the German and Austrian governments during the Holocaust. Sadly, that has not been um, the case in the United States in terms of acknowledging what has happened with the Holocaust. Um, my daughters, when they were in high school in Nevada, um, the Holocaust education that they received was factually incorrect. It downplayed the extent of the atrocities and downplayed the suffering of the Holocaust. This was very disturbing for my children because of their personal knowledge and connection to that tragedy. I know we can do better. I know we are better. And so that's why I actually sponsored legislation to strengthen resources on Holocaust education and genocides in general, and why I'm here today supporting uh, AB 231. AB 231 creates a powerful conversation and brings important resources to Nevada to ensure we educate our children on the stories of the Holocaust, the Armenian genocide, and other genocides. I ask that you support this. Our children deserve to know the correct history. Thank you very much, and thank you for giving me your time. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for your testimony. Um, I believe we have uh, Ms. Julie Breslin to testify briefly as well. Go ahead. Uh, Chair Bilbray Axelrod, this is Alyssa Nabors for the record on behalf of the Answers Information League. In the interest of time, Julie's going to call in and support, and I will conclude the testimony by doing this section by section. If that is all right with you, Chair. Sure. Thank you, Chair Bilberry Axelrod and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Alyssa Nayworth here today on behalf of the anti Destination League. I want to thank the Assemblywomen, uh, Cohen Krasner, and of course, Lieutenant Governor for their immense assistance on this effort. I will tell you that it took a village to get here today. I'm very proud of this bill. Section one of the bill as amended would add a new section to NRS chapter 388. Specifically, it would require the State Board of Education to create a subcommittee to study the best ways to provide age appropriate and historically accurate instruction for the Holocaust. Section 1, subsection 2 lists the topics and recommendations the subcommittees must address throughout the course of the study. This includes how the curriculum should be modified, inventory available classroom resources, any professional development necessary for teachers, and looking at similar instruction being provided in other states. Section 1, sub 3 recommends the subcommittee should review how the current standards support comprehensive Holocaust education. Those current standards are outlined in subs a through L, the goal for the subcommittee is to create a crosswalk that links current standards with community resources, which will serve to inform implementation of updated standards that aligns with best practices. Section 1, sub 4 lists out at a minimum, and that is critical, who must serve on the subcommittee. At a minimum, those folks include uh, the superintendent of public instruction or his or her designee, three members representing the governor's, governor's advisory council on educating relating to the Holocaust, Three members representing nonprofit organizations that have developed curriculum regarding the Holocaust or other genocides for use in public school. At least one member representing a large school district, one member representing a small school district, at least one member representing a charter school located in the state, and at least one member representing nonprofits that have developed curriculum for use in 
public schools regarding other genocides. I want to note that sub G of subsection four was purposely added to ensure at least one member will be part of the conversation that is specific curriculum knowledge as to other genocides, such as the Cambodian, Rwandan, Sudanese, Darfuri, Greek, and or Armenian genocide. Since this section sets a minimum bar, there could be several of these folks included, and we want to encourage that. Section one sub five states that the subcommittee will report its findings to the State Board of Education, and the state report will submit a report to the Legislative Committee on Education for you all to review in the next legislative session. Section one sub six requires the Legislative Committee on Education to consider the reports and submit a, a written report to the legislature. Section one sub seven defines terms throughout the section. Section two states that nothing in the bill changes the requirements for submitting a report regarding the Holocaust. And section three states that the bill becomes effective July 1st, 2021. Thank you, Ms. Nave. Once again, channeling her inner Susan Furlong. <laughs> Very impressive. Um, okay, I will. With that, I will go to uh, the committee for questions. Questions from the committee. And I just, I'm sure all the committee members know, but anybody who is watching on Nellis, the bill is the amendment now. So um, just refer to that, and it is on Nellis. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions, and oh. Okay, I see Assemblywoman Torres has a question. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, Assemblywoman Cohen, Assemblywoman Krasner, and, and team, Lieutenant Governor, thank you. I appreciate the remarks. Um, and, and I definitely agree that we need to do a better job uh, incorporating Holocaust education. As an educator, I had the honor to teach about the Holocaust in my own classroom this last year. Um, and for me, I think it's it's always moving to be able to share this experience with students um, and to be able to ensure that they understand the history so that we can stop hate um, at its inception, right? And I think that's what's important about this. And, you know, I, I've spoken um, with a couple of individuals on this call and the, the Armenian community has come out and they're just simply asking to be recognized. And I understand that the amendment language includes them um, in this task force. Um, and at this point, I've received dozens of emails um, just requesting that, like, some mention of the Armenian genocide is within this piece of legislation. Um, and, you know, given that uh, nations today continue to refuse recognition um, of this tragic genocide, I, I just want to understand our, the reasoning why we're not including that language um, in the legislation. Uh, Chair Bill by Axrod, for the record, this is Alyssa Nayworth on behalf of the Anti-Defamation League. Uh, and uh, through you to Assemblywoman Torres, uh, the Anti-Defamation League believes that to combat all hate or anti-Semitism, you have to combat all hate. And fully understands and is sympathetic um, and wants to include the voice of not only the Ar Armenian community, but the Rwandan community, the Darfuri community, and other communities that have suffered similar uh, other atrocities similar to the Holocaust. Uh, we walk the fine line of not calling out a single other genocide to the exclusion of the rest of the ones that we have listed. And we want them to be at the table to ensure that as this curriculum is honed and developed, that their voice and the, the, their stories and their narratives are heard much in the way of the original intent of the creating the Governor's Council on the Holocaust. And that is why subsection G was added um, to ensure that not only the Armenian community, but other communities that have, have historical atrocities that must be told, because we believe that in telling the story of genocide as a, as a humanity, we are more empathetic and understand the importance of being more involved and, and speaking out against hate at any time. We felt that by calling out one specific genocide, it would be to the inclusion, it, exclusion of others. That was the advice we received multiple times through the drafting process. Um, and so we believe that this is the best, the best and most pragmatic solution to ensure that their voice is going to be heard. Assemblywoman Tolls. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for bringing this legislation forward. And every time that we can bring awareness to and light to um, learning from history and acknowledging the challenges that we face currently is um, incredibly valuable and I appreciate it very much. Um, and I also appreciate the comments from my my colleague, Assemblywoman Torres, and, um, and just the thoughtfulness and response. Um, 
My question is specifically in the amended language as I'm looking at uh, section one, subsection C4, and it goes through outlining who's in the subcommittee. I noticed that we have at least one member representing a school district with 60,000 or more pupils. And of course, in the state of Nevada, that would um, incorporate um, only one of our top two um, most populated school districts. Obviously, Park County and Washoe County would fall into that category. So um, if I could just ask, why not have um, two or why not have 60,000 and then have, you know, um, 400,000 and above? Uh, why did we just only allow one of those two school districts to participate? Or maybe I'm reading it wrong and perhaps there's the option to have both. Uh, Chair Bill Ray Axod, again, Alyssa Nave Worth on behalf of the Anthony Information League through you to Assemblywoman Tolls. Thank you for your question. You are reading the legislation correctly in the sense that it requires at least one of the two large school districts to participate, but it's a minimum standard. And I believe, and I, I don't want to speak on behalf of um, the assembly women and Lieutenant Governor, but we would encourage that more people, um, that both of the districts um, participate. And so it's just to create a minimum standard to ensure that there's at least one large district and one small district, but if all the districts would like to participate, that would be more than appropriate. That answer, I suppose I would just make my request official on the record that I would, um, I, I would love to see it amended in so it's clear that both would be included. Um, it, as I'm on the, on the committee, that would just be my request and I'm happy to talk about it offline. Thanks. Thank you, Assemblywoman Tools. And I believe that Assemblyman Flores had a question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Assembly, excuse me, Madam Chair. And, and thank you, Assemblywoman Cohen uh, for, for bringing this very important piece of legislation. Um, I echo the sentiment of all my colleagues of just how important it is. Uh, the, the only question I have is, uh, did we have any other members of the community from any particular community reach out asking to also be included um, in, in, so that they can highlight their pain and suffrage? Uh, or was it just the Armenian community? Leslie Cohen, Assembly District uh, 29. I have not heard from any other uh, communities, but I, I will tell you that when I was um, first approached about bringing this legislation, one of the first things I said is I, I wanted to include other genocides. Um, and I don't know if, uh, and like I said, there has been a coalition that's been working on this uh, for quite some time. And I don't know if they have, have heard from any other communities. Thank you, Assembly. Well, Madam Chair, if I could have a quick follow-up. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and the only reason I asked is, is um, obviously the reason we're bringing forth a bill that ensures that we, we talk about the Holocaust, that we don't ever allow anybody to forget is because a group of folk came forth and said, we have to make sure that we never allow people to forget. And, and I make that point only to, to make the point that if we've also had other members of our community who said, look, we also wanna make sure that we be given an opportunity to, to make sure that we are never forgotten in the same way and we only have them too, because I, I get the concern of saying, well, if we open the door, um, there may be, it may become impossible for us to have every single community represented that's gone through a horrible moment in history. Um, but I will say that if we only have uh, the Armenian community who has a footprint in Nevada come forth and speak, I will support this bill in any way that you all want to move it. But I, I did want to make, make it a point because I had an opportunity to have a very lengthy conversation with the Armenian community I understand that at some point they uh, they were working on a bill and we're hoping to to really put you know the horrible suffrage uh, that they've gone through in in, in, a, in in a piece of legislation. So I just gave my word to them that I would say I would advocate for it. Obviously, you all uh, I will support this bill in any way that you all want to do it. It's your bill. Um, but I will say if if we have if we don't have any any other members of the community really pushing hard, then. I don't know that we, we should be that concerned about saying, well, we have to include 45 different more communities, et cetera. Um, and I just wanted to put that out there into the space. But like I said, I will support this bill in whatever way you all think is best. Thank you, Leslie Cohen, Assembly District 29. I think just because we're not hearing from other communities doesn't mean there, there wouldn't be an interest. Um, when you look at the list 
of genocides in the 20th century. Um, it, it's somewhat overwhelming. Um, it, it's longer than what we've said. And we have, a, you know, we have addressed some of that in the legislature. I believe we have, you know, we've talked about, or I, I think we've had resolutions regarding um, the Greek genocide, or at least there was a bill on that. Um, and, and we have acknowledged the Armenian genocide in the Nevada legislature. Um, and I, I don't think that, you know, when you think about some of our areas of Nevada, especially in Southern Nevada, where they're so multicultural, where there are Cambodians, um, there are, um, um, you know, Poles, there are Greeks, there are people um, from these different groups that I, I just don't think it would be right to to specifically list out two. Um, but we did specifically say that this bill is going to include Holocaust education, or not just Holocaust education, but education on other genocides. And specifically, I'm adding that to the um, to the subcommittee so that any of those organ any of those groups that want to be a part of of the subcommittee can be a part of it. Um, and I I do think we again that we do need to look out for those other groups that maybe aren't as organized. Any other follow ups? Uh, no, thank you, Assemblywoman. Um, any other questions from committee? I'm having a problem looking at the chat. Um, so raise your hand if you have a question. No. OK, so we will move on to callers. I believe we have several in the queue. Um, and you know what? Is Jolie still on? Or did she go over to the queue? Uh, she went over to the queue. No, I'm still here. Oh. Uh, just because I know you were supposed to be a speaker and we went over in time, I will give you, um, if you want to have two minutes in support, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Bill Bray Axelrod and members of the committee. For the record, I'm Julie Brislin. I'm the Regional Director of the Anti-Defamation League. And I sit here representing our partners, Jewish Nevada and ICANN in support of Assembly Bill 231. ADL is a leading anti-hate organization and a global leader in exposing extremism and delivering anti-bias education. Since 2005, ADL in partnership with the USC Shoah Foundation and Yad Vashem Holocaust Remembrance Center in Jerusalem have trained more than 85,000 educators through our Echoes and Reflections, our Holocaust education program, which allows teachers to introduce students to the complex themes of the Holocaust and genocide and its impact on the world. In total, this program has reached an estimated 8 million students across the United States at no cost to the states at all. ADL has worked diligently on this issue here and around the country, and we are very grateful for Nevada legislators led by Assemblywoman Cohen and Assembly, Assemblymember Krasner um, for taking an important step. This also comes at a time when Holocaust and genocide awareness, particularly among young people, is fading from memory, but not fading as a threat. According to one recent study, 22% of American millennials have never even heard of the Holocaust or are unsure whether they have heard of it. And, and only 35% of all Americans know about the Armenian genocide. By learning about the Holocaust and other genocides, students, um, will have the opportunity to explore how stereotypes, prejudice, and religious and ethnic hatred can escalate to atrocity. Words and actions matter, and it's an imperative that our students understand the risk when hatred and bigotry go unchecked. This bill will send a strong message to educators, students, and families in, that Nevada recognizes the importance of Holocaust and genocide education and is committed to doing everything possible to prevent the rise and escalation of bias motivated incidents in our schools. For, for all these reasons, ADL, Jewish Nevada, and ICANN urge this committee to support this critical and timely legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. And with that, BPS, I will open it up to callers in support. To testify in support on Assembly Bill 231, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 486, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. 
Hi, it's Alexander Marks, M-A-R-K-S, uh, with the Nevada State Education Association. Um, NSEA supports AB 231, revising provisions governing education on the Holocaust and other genocides. Um, NSA has had a standing position in support of Holocaust education since 1996 with a resolution adopted at our delegate assembly. This position was affirmed and expanded in 1998 and 2002. Uh, the NSCA believes that the lessons of the Holocaust will lead to greater understanding of and respect for diversity. We also believe that inclusion of Holocaust education should be included in the school curriculum. Uh, we further believe that the Holocaust education could be included in any appropriate curricular areas. Uh, we also have a standing policy on genocide education, also adopted in 1996 and affirmed and updated in 2002, uh, believing that education regarding acts of genocide will help students empathize with others and to respect diversity. Uh, we also believe that that education about genocide should be included in the school curriculum. Educators understand intolerance and has no place in our schools. Instruction on the Holocaust and other genocides is even more critical in these times of increasing hate and anti-Semitism. Um, and then just as a personal story, having grown up in the Clark County School District, uh, we would had several Holocaust survivors, uh, in particular a gentleman named Sasha Semenov, come visit our gate class several times. Uh, the stories this gentleman would tell you would uh, just, it really puts the things into perspective of this issue and really grasps an understanding and respect for this issue. Um, uh, he had a story about, uh, I guess he learned the violin at, at age nine and a German soldier once saw him standing with a mandolin and told him to play, I think it was La Paloma. And he told us all that, that, uh, his ability to play the violin saved his life that day. It put everybody in a, a better mood and to tell a, a group of elementary school students that that saved his life was just, I got to tell you, it was just a life changing experience to hear a gentleman tell you that, um, I would encourage you to ensure that we can have these kinds of stories be told and retold again and again in our uh, curriculum. The lessons of Holocausts and other uh, this Holocaust and the other genocides should be included in the curriculum, and we urge your passage of AB 231. Thank you. Mr. Marks. Next caller in support. Caller with the last three digits of 916, please press star six to unmute. You will have two minutes. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record and you may begin. Sure, for the record, my name is Dylan Hosier, D-I-L-L-O-N-H-O-S-I-E-R, Chairman and CEO of ICANN, the Israeli American Civic Action Network. Chairwoman Vilbury Axelrod, members of the committee, thank you so much uh, for this hearing this morning. Uh, this afternoon, rather. Um, again, my name is Dylan Hosier, Chair and CEO of ICANN. We're an organization dedicated to empowering Nevada's Israeli immigrant community. Uh, it's great to be here with you today virtually, and I hope we get to see each other in person soon. Uh, first, I wish to thank Assembly Members Cohen and Krasner for taking the lead on AB 231. And I also want to thank Lieutenant Governor Kate Marshall, who has been a strong friend to Nevada's Jewish and Israeli communities. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor, uh, for supporting and, and helping to lead on this effort. I also want to thank my colleagues from Jewish Nevada and the ADL who have been great partners in support of this uh, bill. I'm going to start out by mentioning how important this bill is for our Israeli community in Nevada. Uh, our community is acutely aware of the rising hate and intolerance targeting communities across America. Yes, anti-Semitism is on the rise, uh, but so is anti-Asian hate, anti-Latino and anti-immigrant hate, anti-LGBT hate, and racism against black indigenous peoples. For Israelis in Nevada, knowledge and education about the Holocaust is a necessary tool, yes, in the fight against anti-Semitism, but also in the broader fight against hate and intolerance against all people, so that atrocities that happened almost 80 years ago won't happen again, and so that never again is more than just a slogan, but a promise that we must all work to keep. The provisions in AB 231 establishing the subcommittee to create educational standards within the Nevada Department of Education is a sensible and meaningful step forward in improving Holocaust and genocide education in Nevada for the benefit of all Nevadans. Uh, Chair and members of the committee, we thank you for your time this afternoon, and we respectfully ask for your support of this bill, AB 231. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hosier, for the call. Next call in support. Caller, please press star six now to unmute. You will have two minutes. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record and you may begin. Uh, thank you. 
Chairwoman Bill Baraxarod and members of the commi- of the committee. For the record, my name is Jacob Kone, C C O N E H, and I am an eighth grade student at the Adelson Educational Campus. I am Jewish and a great grandson of Holocaust survivors. Today, not everyone, especially those of my generation, have heard of the Holocaust, and as time passes, we get further and further from that period and lose survivors. We see signs that people do not seem to grasp the meaning and the absolute horror that one group of people committed against another. The Holocaust was the systematic, bureaucratic, state-sponsored persecution, murder, and annihilation of approximately 6 million Jews by the Nazi regime. It literally translates by Greek origin to sacrifice by fire. The Nazis, who came to power in Germany in January 1933, believed that the Germans were racially superior and that the Jews, specifically because of their religion and different belief system, were deemed inferior and a threat to the German racial community. It took the Germans and their accomplices four and a half years to intentionally murder six million people, just like me, only because of their religion. They never showed any restraint and slowed down only when they began to run out of Jews to kill. They only stopped when the Allies finally defeated them. There was no escape. The murderers were not content with destroying the communities. They also tracked down each hidden Jew and hunted down each person that ran. The crime of being a Jew, a person like me, was so great that every single one had to be put to death. All men, women, and children. We were all meant to suffer and to die. By 1945, most of the Jews of Europe were dead, and it wasn't only Jews that were murdered. Persons of color, disabilities, and homosexuals were also murdered. All of these people were killed because they were different. We need Holocaust education because the Holocaust is perhaps the most infamous genocide committed in all of human history, and kids of all ages need to learn, know, and acknowledge that this happened. By teaching this, Nevada schools will be cultivating in our community a sense of moral responsibility among our residents and inspiring respect, tolerance, and mutual understanding in response to incidents of hate, intolerance, discrimination against all races, and extremism. Kids of all ages need to learn about this period so that this period is never denied nor forgotten. Future generations need to be reminded of the past and to ensure that it does not happen again. The Holocaust is a warning that the unthinkable is possible, even now, and that human nature makes any, many people susceptible to the abuse of power, a belief in the inferiority of the other, and ability to justify any behavior, including ignoring it and doing nothing at all. My kid, kids my age a sh- face a shocking lack of knowledge about the facts and history of the Holocaust. My older sister, Remy, realized this when she attended Bishop Gorman in high school, following the years at Adelson. So she met with her counselors, and together they came up with a strategy to teach young students about the Holocaust for the first time in Gorman's existence of over 80 years. The religion and history teachers invited survivors to speak about their experience. After hearing from actual survivors the tragedy and triumph they endured, there was no denying it, no making fun of it, and no forgetting it. The hope is to teach students early and often that that there is no room for intolerance and to constantly remind them that there is no room for the past to be repeated, especially today when we have social justice movements like Black Lives Matter. There are constant emails about swastikas on our campuses, on our homes, or threats made against Jewish students and anti-Semitism. It's the fastest growing hate crime in the United States and the world. These are our realities every single day. Remembering the Holocaust is more than remembering my ancestors. We're at over three minutes, and I'm so sorry because I love hearing from you, Mr. Kone. I'm, but I'm, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap it up if you could. I'm sorry. Thank you, uh, Chair Bill Axrod and committee members for considering AB 231. Mm-hmm. On behalf of not only me but also my peer group and all of my ancestors, I urge your support of this bill. As we always say, we need to forgive but never forget. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kone, for your your very personal testimony. Appreciate that. Love to have students participate. Next caller and support. Caller with the last three digits of 064, please press star six to unmute. Once again, caller with the last three digits of 064, Please press star six to unmute. I will. There we go. If you could slowly state and spell your name for the record, you have two minutes and may begin. Hi, my name is Lena Hovanesian. My name is spelled L E 
N N A, and my last name is H O V A N E S S I A N. Ms. Hovesian, we are in support right yes. now. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> yes, we are in support with amendments. Um, oh, okay. I'm, I'm throwing sure. opposition on Nellis. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I have a statement. Okay, are you in, just to clarify, are you in, uh, in um, support as the bill is written currently? Or no, we amendment. One? Okay, so that would technically be in opposition. Okay, then please put me in the opposition. I'll put you back in the queue and we'll circle back. Okay. Okay, next caller in support. Caller with the last three digits of 338, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you, please go ahead. Hello, yes, hello, my name is Heidi Strauss and I am a Clark County Holocaust uh, professional development educator of our teachers. And I'm also the Holocaust education chair on behalf of Jewish Nevada we respectfully ask for your support, a council chairwoman and the whole committee of AB 231. We are working feverishly to teach teachers to teach the Holocaust correctly, but are only skimming the surface. Research is needed to fully identify what we are doing right and where gaps are in the teaching of this curricula. While hatred of the other, anyone considered the other isn't new, Expressions of it are at an all-time high, and I would say escalating exponentially. Teaching the stories of the Holocaust are considered the gold standard in the creation of empathy in our students because it teaches that we are all part of the same family, the human family. Allowing hatred of the other is not an option, as the Holocaust showed us what unbridled hatred can lead to. We can use expanded Holocaust education to create more empathy in our most valuable resources, our children, so that they gain more respect and even an appreciation of each other's differences. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Strauss, for the call. Next caller yes. in support. Caller with the last three digits of 090. Please press star six to unmute. You will have two minutes. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record and you may begin. Good afternoon, I'm Stephanie Tuzman, T-U-Z-M-A-N, President and CEO of Jewish Nevada. Um, thank you to Chair Bilberry Axelrod and members of the committee. Uh, this hits very close to home for me, both personally and professionally. First, I'm the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors who sadly are no longer here to tell their story and who never wanted to talk about the Holocaust when they were here. I was fortunate to learn about Holocaust education throughout school growing up in Michigan and through my many life experiences. Professionally, in my work at Jewish Nevada, our mission is to continue to build vibrancy and continuity in Jewish life, providing opportunities for engagement, and more importantly, to educate about where we, we have been and what we as a people have endured so that we will never forget. Jewish Nevada is proud to partner with our colleagues from ADL and ICANN in support of AB 231. As both Jolie and Dylan so eloquently stated, Holocaust and genocide education is critical at this time. And in the interest of time, I edited my comments because I don't want to repeat what they've already said, excuse me, what they've already stated, but we add our thanks and, um, and appreciation for your support of AB 231. Thank you very much for the call. Next caller in support. Caller with the last three digits of 800. Please press star six to unmute. Once again, caller with the last three digits of 800. Please press star six to unmute. You will have two minutes. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record, and you may begin. Yes, I am Rafi Hovanesian. Um, I just wanted to say that I am in support with the amendments that include the Armenian Genocide. 
Um, I wanted to be put under opposition in that case. I mean, we are going, we are going to opposition next. I think we have about two more calls in support and then we will move on to opposition. So can you okay. back into the queue? Okay. Thank you. Call next call. Sorry, Chair. Caller with the last two digit, three digits of 858, please fully state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Yes, this is John Sandy the uh, Fourth, S A N D E, here today on behalf of the Las Vegas Sands. Uh, first, want to thank uh, Assemblywoman Cohen and Krasner, as well as Lieutenant uh, <laughs> Lieutenant Governor Marshall, uh, for their leadership in this issue. Uh, as you are aware, the founder of our company uh, passed away earlier this year, and uh, we know that this is something that he would be very proud to see uh, the state moving forward with and. Uh, we wanted to honor him and his uh, legacy and his memory by being here in support today. Uh, I had some prepared remarks, but in interest uh, in deference to your time, I will uh, just say that we support this for all the reasons the uh, previous speakers have uh, laid, laid forth before you. And I want to thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Sandy. And next caller in support. Color with the last three digits of 807. Please press star six to unmute. You will have two minutes. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record, and you may begin. Andy Armenian, Madam Chair, Honorable Members of the Education Committee. Mr. Armenian, uh, Mr. Armenian, Mr. We are still in support, and if you are offering an amendment to change the bill. That is actually in opposition. So we will get to you in just, I, I, I think we might have one more caller and then we're gonna to move to opposition. Okay. For those okay, callers so who have just joined, we are currently on testimony in support of Assembly Bill 231. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. To testify in support on AB 231, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, at this time, the line is open and working. We have no more callers in support of Assembly Bill 231 as written. Thank you very much. And with that, I will close the call in support. And I apologize for everyone listening. I know it's a little confusion confusing, but our rules stand that if you were to call in support, it is the bill as presented um, with any amendments that have been accepted. So if you're, you like the bill, but you want, even if you want just a line change, that is technically in opposition. So now we will open the testimony in opposition and I hope we can get um, everyone back. So let's take the first call in opposition. Testify in opposition on Assembly Bill 231. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 137, please press star six to unmute. You will have two minutes. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record and you may begin. Hi, this is Brandy Harrison for the record. This is an important bill and I'd like to request amendments to make the bill more favorable and inclusive concerning genocide. This bill leaves out America's original sin of slavery that lasted over 150 years. Our educational institutions have a responsibility to teach about the history of US slavery. We also need to learn about the impact slavery has had on American society after emancipation. There are amendments that will make the bill more viable. The three requested amendments are, number one, change the title of the bill to include United States chattel slavery, or simply title the bill Education on Genocide. Number two, include language about the history of United States slavery and descendants of slaves in the United States, also referred to as freedmen, specifically study slavery, lynching, black codes, pig laws, medical experimentation, 
stolen land, stolen money, and stolen intellectual property, Jim Crow, mass incarceration, and hundreds of massacres that occurred. Number three, include book recommendations for teachers to use as teaching tools, such as the best-selling book, From Here to Equality, by Dr. William Darity, one of our nation's leading economists. These amendments will provide a better understanding of slavery and the Holocaust. I hope you take these important recommendations into consideration and pass a more comprehensive and inclusive bill that governs genocide. And to all the assembly men and assembly women, the descendant of slavery community, the black community here in Nevada, has expressed a deep interest in this bill and these amendments. Thank you. Thank you very much for the phone call. Um, next call in opposition. Caller with the last three digits of 064. Please press star six now to unmute. You will have two minutes. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record and you may begin. My name is Lena Hovanesian and it's spelled L-E-N-N-A. Last name is Hovanesian, H-O-V-A-N-E-S-S-I-A-N. 106 years ago, and still no justice. In the United States of America, we would like the Armenian Genocide to be taught as historical fact. In 2019, both houses of Congress, the, the House and the Senate, House of Representatives and the Senate acknowledged the, the truth and acknowledged the Armenian Genocide. And as part of the congressional record, there was a recommendation to teach the Armenian genocide as part of the educational system. We, the Armenian community of Nevada is urging the Nevada legislature to follow the federal uh, mandate to teach the Armenian genocide as part of the recognition. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Lena Hovanesian, as you know, and I would like to first thank the chair, uh, Shannon Bilbray Axelrod of the committee and also all the other committee members who were so kind to listen to the pleas of the Armenian community here in Nevada. I also want to thank the Lieutenant Governor for carrying us through with AB 56, which was the original format of this bill, which specifically included the Jewish Holocaust and the Armenian genocide in its specific language. So now that there's AB 231, the Armenian community is dismayed that the Armenian genocide has been omitted um, and diluted down to other genocides. Inclusion is, is paramount because uh, human rights are equal rights. And as, the, as a representative of the Armenian community, and as a community that is growing in the state of Nevada that has a significant footprint with great individuals who have built, you know, uh, so much into this city, like Kirk Kerkorian and Jerry Tarkanian, who are children of genocide survivors who came to the state of Nevada and also they built their American dream but were able to give back in spades to the state of Nevada. And there's so many more of us. We feel disenfranchised. We feel discriminated against by not being specifically included. As Assemblyman Flores and uh, Assemblywoman Torres so eloquently stated, why not include us when we are here advocating at the table? We are here and our community is watching to see, are they going to sideline us again? Are they going to deny our truth again? To this day, Ottoman Turkey, who discriminated and systematically er eradicated 1.5 million Armenians from 1915 to 1923, has still not acknowledged the Armenian genocide. The truth still has not been served and justice has not been served, even though internationally it is known as truth, including the National Library of Congress. So we're asking the members of the Assembly to acknowledge the truth and the most fundamental teaching of truth happens in the classroom, in education. And if we don't include, we are excluding the Armenian Genocide because we were in AB 56. We are advocating to be included. And if you don't include us, you are excluding us today. And we are very, very upset by that. 
we have dealt with denialism for 106 years by the perpetrators. We don't expect it to happen in the Nevada legislature. And we expect you to rise up in leadership and speak out our truth because we're here to advocate. We want the Armenian genocide included. We support the Jewish Holocaust being taught, but we also want an equal, uh, an equal seat at the table. We want our genocide taught and recognized so history does not repeat itself. This is a human rights violation. It is an equal opportunity killer. It doesn't select one group over another. Thank you very much for yes. your testimony. Thank you very much. Next caller Thank in opposition. You. Caller with the last three digits of 211, please press star six to unmute. You will have two minutes. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record and you may begin. My name is Kelly Pryor. Last name is spelled P-R-Y as in yo-yo, O-R. I am a descendant of U.S. chattel slavery and freedmen. Uh, unfortunately, a descendant of one of the greatest atrocities to happen on U.S. soil. But with that being said, um, I want to say that I am opposed to AB 231. I would like clarity on who the other genocides are actually going to be. Uh, the genocide that has happened to my people and the slow genocide going on right now, I think is a disrespect to consider it as just a quote of their genocide. Regarding the, end of, uh, the education about the Holocaust, I implore that the curriculum reflect how anti-Semitic and how anti-Jew the United States was from the very beginning and how at the beginning of the Nazi Germany, when all the programs of stealing from, murdering Jewish people, and while Jews were trying to get out of Germany to the U.S., that the U.S. would not even allow Jewish immigrants here. I think connecting the dots about what happened in Germany, as unfortunate as it is, will encourage more empathy as opposed to just sympathy because of something that did not happen on U.S. soil. Educate that quite as it's kept, that most of the people in the U.S. did not have a problem with Hitler. Truth be told, too many people here in the U.S don't have a problem with fascism, white supremacy. Most white people in the U.S. did not want to enter World War II to fight Hitler. It wasn't until Japan attacked the U.S. and Hitler declared war on the U.S. that only then white people in the U.S. decided to enter World War II. But for that, they didn't want anything to do with Hitler and didn't have a problem with what was going on. So if you're going to teach about the Holocaust and teach it, teach how what happened there parallels with what goes on here in the United States along with the fact that our former president almost pulled this off with the whole weaponizing of the political system, which is exactly what Hitler did. History is already repeating itself, and unfortunately, the Jewish people in Israel know better, but they are still do almost doing the same thing with a militaristic government that is brutalizing their people. Teach that, teach the whole thing, and connect these dots. Thank you. Thank you for the call in opposition. Next caller in opposition. Caller with the last three digits of 800. Please press star six now to unmute. You will have two minutes. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record and you may begin. My name is Rafi Hovanesian. I firstly want to say I'm in support uh, with the amendments, which include um, the Armenian Genocide. Good afternoon, Edu Education Committee. My name is Rafi Hovanesian, and I am a high school junior. I have eight great grandparents who were all victims of the Ottoman Turks and the Armenian Genocide, which has left a deep impression on me. As a student in world history, in the various history classes I have taken, I have noticed and I am disappointed why the American Armenian Genocide um, and the Holocaust and subsequent genocides all are glossed over without recognizing nor explaining the humanitarian violations and how they occurred. When I realized my great-grandparents' stories of suffering genocides are forgotten, I am saddened how we are not taught how recognition and justice can prevent future genocides. I hope my advocacy will make an impact on you and will change that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hovessian. And as I said before, I 
Really love it, especially in the education committee when we have students call in. So thank you for that. Um, next caller in opposition. Caller with the last three digits of 807. Please press star six now to unmute. You will have two minutes. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record and you may begin. My name is Andy Armenian, A-R-M-E-N-I-A-N. Madam Chair, Honorable Members of the Education Committee and Assemblywoman Cohen. Uh, overall, we're supportive uh, of the AB 231. And uh, however, we would like to have a reference to the Armenian Genocide in the bill. The Armenian Genocide that uh, took place during World War I has been a precursor to the World War II Jewish Holocaust, and both nations have suffered tremendously. And we believe it is important to add the reference to the Armenian Genocide in AB 231. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Armenian. Next caller in opposition. For those who have just joined to testify in opposition on Assembly Bill 231, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once again, to testify in opposition on Assembly Bill 231, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Here, the line is open and working. However, we have no more callers to testify in opposition on Assembly Bill 231. Thank you, BPS. And with that, I will close opposition testimony and open testimony in neutral. Do we have any callers in neutral on AB 231? To testify in the neutral position on Assembly Bill 231, please press start nine now to take your place in the queue. Once again, to testify in the neutral position on Assembly Bill 231, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Here, at this time, the line is open and working. There are no more callers in the neutral position on Assembly Bill 231. Thank you, BPS, and I will close neutral testimony. Um, I will reach out to Assemblywoman Cohn and Assemblywoman Krasner to see if you have any closing remarks. Assemblywoman Krasner, do you want to go first? Uh, thank you, Chair Bill Bray Axelrod and members of the Assembly Education Committee for your time today. I would appreciate your support of this important bill. Thank you. Um, uh, again, thank you, committee. Um, just to be clear, uh, Leslie Cohen, Assembly District tw uh, 29, this is not a new mandate and it's not to the exclusion of others. Um, the bill was brought because despite there being state law mandating Holocaust education, it, there just wasn't enough there. there. There wasn't anything to, there's not enough to give teachers just uh, direction on how to do that appropriately with appropriate standards. Uh, we're very sympathetic to the community and have tried to accommodate them uh, specifically wide, widening the con conversation for them and others. As I, as I mentioned during my testimony, when I was approached about bringing this bill, I specifically said I wanted it to include other genocides. Uh, and this bill in no way excludes the education, um, the Armenian genocide, um, or any other genocides. It gives other groups a seat at the table. Um, but I will just end with and reiterate that in 2019, the FBI reported that Jews and Jewish institutions are the overwhelming, were the overwhelming target of religion-based hate crimes. And it's been that way since 1999, where it's been the highest hate crime, um, religious hate crime in the country. Uh, so I'm well willing to keep this conversation open. 
Um, and I hope you will support this bill. And I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman Cohen. And with that, I will close the hearing on AB 231. And now I am going to open the hear hearing on AB 261. And AB 261 revises provisions governing education to provide diversity and inclusivity in academic standards and curriculum. Assemblywoman Anderson, I know you are not on our committee, but you are very familiar with this committee. So welcome back again and begin when you are ready. Thank you so much for uh, welcoming back to the incredibly hardworking Committee on Education. And I've had an opportunity to meet with you guys many times over the past few years. Uh, my name is Natha Anderson, and it is my honor and pleasure to represent Assembly District 30 and then also to be a teacher. And I want to thank uh, Chair Bill Bray Axelrod, as well as your committee manager for, for planning this uh, so perfectly, because I literally have um, a few pages of stats that I was going to read off and some other things. But then I started listening to the, the hearing on AB 231, the prior hearing. And there are so many elements that are very similar to one reason why I'm bringing this forward. But during the process, I had to at one point put on my mask, and I promise you there's a reason behind the story. And today happened to be a mask where I, uh, which I grabbed that was from a friend, a, a fellow assembly member uh, gave to all of us. And it has our wonderful song, Home Means Nevada, printed on this mask. And as I was listening to the uh, testimony of the past hearing, as well as thinking about this mask and thinking about a few other things, all I can think about is home means Nevada for all of us. It is not just one culture. It is not just one background. It is not just one religion. We have so many different histories. We have so many different experiences. We have so many different items that we have to learn from each other about. We need to start to do that in our textbooks, not just in our instructional materials, excuse me, not just in our discussions. And so that's kind of why I'm bringing, that's very much why I'm bringing forward AB uh, 261. And I also uh, was trying to figure out a way to bring in somebody that I greatly admire, who's a leader of our nation, uh, Cesar Chavez, whose birthday was yesterday. And his quote is still true for us today. He said at one point, preservation of one's own culture does not require contempt or disrespect for others. It is an opportunity for us to discuss with each other these differences. I have firsthand experience as a teacher where I had the opportunity to teach uh, Eli Weissel's Night or Rodolfo Anya's uh, Bless Me Ultima or the other West Moore by West Moore, uh, autobiography. Uh, Joy Hojo's Poetry of Today and so many other diverse backgrounds that becomes a mirror of many of our students, but also becomes a reflection or a window, more importantly, of other worlds. It allows us a, a stronger discussion. It allows us a stronger environment of trust. This is the current practice, actually, of our school districts and of our state to attempt to try to find textbooks as well as instructional materials when they are adopted county and statewide, which actually includes more than just one point of view. And accurately, I think that was a very important point that was made in the last, in the AB 231's hearing as well. It has to accurately portray it. That is the attempt at this time to always do that. And as a matter of fact, as we're going through some of the uh, process of looking through the textbooks and looking through these items, what's being found out is our textbooks, the publishers are trying to do this, but it's not where it needs to be. And so this is yet one more way for us to be able to bring in the importance of showing how different our world is and also how we need to get textbooks and instructional materials that show that. Um, one of the pieces of, of evidence that I will now bring forward actually comes from children's literature. Although I'm a high school teacher, I, I'm enamored with high school, uh, with children's books, as I think some of you already know, and I try my best to always connect um, children's books to actually Shakespeare. Uh, there's nothing quite like trying to do the id, the ego, and the super ego when you, when you analyze Dr. Seuss. But anyway, um, 
there is a group, it is out of Wisconsin, which actually does a study as to how many children's books are published every year that are not just having white children as the main characters. From the 2018 study, and this is out of uh, the Cooperative Children's Book Center out of Wisconsin-Madison. In 2018, 1% of the characters were portrayed as American Indians or First Nations. Of that 1%, the majority were portrayed from the past. We're not seeing our American Indians and our First Nation students being portrayed in our published materials. 5% are Latina or Latino. Now that number did go up a little bit in 2019, but not enough to make a difference. 7% were Asian Pacific Islanders, 10% were African and African American. 27% were animals or other imaginary characters and 50% were white children. It is not just what's being taught in our classroom. It's also what is available for us to be able to use. And so by utilizing this tool of trying to bring forward curriculum that is a little bit more inclusive, maybe we can help with other states as well to put a little bit more pressure onto the textbook companies to look for those other areas. California has a very similar bill, I believe, that's moving forward. Oregon and Illinois has already adopted. And for those people in education, you know that there are three states that pretty much create textbook world. And that would be Texas, California, I believe it's Michigan, I, but I don't want to give Vice Chair uh, Miller too much credit. Speaking of which, please accept my apology for the late. Thank you very much for, for allowing me to present to you today, uh, Chair Bill Berry Axelrod, Vice Chair Miller, and members of the Education Committee. I would just like to very quickly go over the bill itself. It does two things. The first thing it does is it actually um, directs the Department of Education to go over the standards to make sure that they include more than just one point of view accurately, which have that in the standards, for uh, a variety of points of view. And it would be during, going through their current model of those review of standards. Initially, I was going to try to have them do it by a certain date, but I've already told you exactly why I can't. The textbooks aren't there yet. This, this is the way for us to get them there. The second item that it does is it then asks, asks for these items to also be considered when it's actually time to adopt the textbook items and instructional materials. It's important to know that I've utilized instructional materials, not just textbooks, because our supplemental texts are incredibly important. And sometimes people only think of the textbooks, but yet many times it's those titles of the other, of the other novels and nonfiction books that actually helps our students make those connections amongst themselves. My decision to bring this forward was based upon a number of discussions with a number of different groups, but probably the most solid and most important group of individuals I had the opportunity to meet with were a group of high school seniors. Well, some of them were juniors as well. And then also some recent graduates. I worked actually with the Las Vegas Youth Power Project, as well as the Washoe High Students for Change. It shows that our students, they might not be the ones that are actually going to be benefiting from this change, but they recognize that their advocacy as well as their legacy is what's much more important than their personal experiences. So with your permission, Chair Bill Bray Axelrod, may I hand it over to Nathan Noble, who's my intern this year, as well as a recent graduate of the Washington County School District, and is currently a freshman at the University of Nevada in Reno. Go ahead, Mr. Noble. Thank you, Assemblywoman, Chair Bilberry Axelrod. Hello, committee members. My name is Nathan Noble, for the record, N-A-T-H-A-N-N-O-B-L-E. I'm a student at the University of Nevada, Reno, and as Ms. Anderson mentioned, I'm currently her intern. I am also a proud product of the Nevada public school system. Having recently graduated, I've gained a bit of a new perspective on my education, an education that unfortunately ended abruptly in the spring of 2020, when I, like all of my peers, was sent into quarantine. Having little to do in quarantine, I binged a lot of TV shows. One day I was sitting down to watch HBO's Watchmen. Great show. The first scene, though, 
depicts the Tulsa massacre, which was the largest and most horrific race massacre in our nation's history. As depicted, it was brutal, terrifying, but also the first time I had ever heard about it. After doing some Googling, I was shocked to learn that this had actually happened because I had learned nothing about it in AP US history. Now a television show was doing what my school should have. This isn't an isolated incident. Ask any public school student across the state and they'll have a story just like this one. Something that was overlooked, some omission, an oversight, something that wasn't covered. Each of these instances stack up and together they form a skewed picture of our world. I've met countless students who have entered the world unprepared because they weren't taught about the past properly. And I've witnessed firsthand how an incomplete view of the past breeds ignorance and how in turn that ignorance can sow the seeds of bigotry. At this point, I should mention that this is not the fault of Nevada's teachers. On the contrary, all of my teachers were great. This isn't even a character flaw with the students. Some of the brightest, most curious people I know still fell prey to this. Heck, it's not even about what's in the textbooks. It's about what's left out. Surely we can do better. And that brings us to AB 261. You know that age old question students ask in class, when am I going to use this? How does this apply to me? This bill is the answer. Personally, I like it because of its flexibility, universal applicability, and innovative solution to the problem of financing. But most of all, I like that it's based on the core beliefs that the diversity of our state must be reflected in the material we teach our students, and that including a multiplicity of perspectives is essential for true learning. To me, this bill is a no-brainer. It costs nothing, both morally and fiscally. It requires no compromise and would infringe on nothing. And chiefly amongst its innumerable benefits, this bill would provide recognition for a whole new generation of Nevadans, truly allowing them to see themselves and their struggles reflected in our common history. And that's who this bill's for. Not me, I've graduated, but for those who come after. There is no middle ground between ignorance and truth between knowledge and a lack thereof. And today we must decide which side we will stand on. Thank you, I yield it back to Ms. Anderson now. Thank Thanks, you. Nathan. If I may uh, hand it over now to Kathleen, or Kathleen Katie Holly, who is a recent graduate of the Clark County Education Adult Program. Katie? Thank you, Assemblywoman Anderson. Um, for the record, my name is Kathleen Hawley, that's K-A-T-H-L-Y-N, last name H-A-W-L-E-Y. Um, as Assemblywoman Anderson just said, I'm a graduate of CCSD's adult education program. And when I was six years old, the father of one of my classmates approached me and told me that I shouldn't hang out with my best friend because, and I quote, her kind will kill you. That's literally what he said. That memory always stuck with me because what he said confused me. I had no idea what he meant, at least not until years later when I learned that he had said that right after the Virginia Tech shooting. My best friend at the time was Asian American. I was never taught about Virginia, the Virginia Tech shooting in school, just like I wasn't taught about Juneteenth, Stonewall, or Marsha P. Johnson. If we don't teach students about minority groups in schools, then harmful and dangerous generalizations, like the one my classmate's father made about my friend, will continue to be passed on from generation to generation. But this bill can help to stop that cycle. My classmate's father was born and raised in Nevada, and he subsequently received the same public education as myself and his daughter. The state of Nevada is doing a disservice to its students by not already including minority groups in its curriculum. But that can change. This bill can give future generations the opportunity to question those harmful generalizations that they may hear from friends, family, or even from the media that they consume. This bill can help to create a more accepting Nevada. Thank you. Do you have somebody else who is testifying? I have one last student. And again, thank you so much for your 
for allowing me to have all three of them speak. If Mia Albright, a junior in the Washington County School District, would also be, like to speak, that would be wonderful. Thank you, Assemblywoman Anderson. My name is Mia Albright, M-I-A-A-L-B-R-I-G-H-T, and I'm a junior at Reno High School. I'm biracial, half white, and half Hispanic. I'm also the daughter of an immigrant, my mom, who along with her family fled war in Nicaragua and grew up in Los Angeles, California. Growing up in the Washoe County School District in Reno, Nevada, taught me nothing about Central America and left me with serious questions about my identity and my culture. A lack of coverage of people of color in curriculum and textbooks had me fervently wishing to only be white. All I wanted in elementary and middle school was to fit in better with my peers at my predominantly white schools. Missing Latinx perspectives also had me forming flawed, racist ideas about what an American is supposed to look like. I used to cringe when my abuela spoke Spanish to me in a grocery store, ashamed and embarrassed of my own family. I considered myself better than other Hispanic students who struggled with speaking English because it wasn't their first language. No student should feel the way I felt, ostracized and alone, and no student should formulate or fall victim to those racist ideologies the way I, that I did. Including multiple perspectives in textbooks would mitigate or even eliminate those issues that, issues that I faced. It would teach empathy and respect for others. It would create a safer, more engaging school environment for all students, whether they are Black, Indigenous, Hispanic, Asian, or white. It would be a significant step in creating schools that work for and represent all of its students. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And with that, did you want to go ahead and um, turn it over for questions? If I could, um, I did want to clarify one small thing as well. Uh, I noticed that there are some school districts that have put on a, that there's a budget possibility. I'm working with uh, Mary Pajinski on trying to figure out where exactly that um, misunderstanding came from. Um, many of these school districts are though on spring break. Uh, the Clark County School District uh, budget will be, or money will be taken off. Uh, Mr. Keating and I spoke about it last night. I believe he's already sent in uh, documentation about that. So I am working on trying to get those uh, unfunded mandates removed. Thank you for that clarification, because I was actually going to ask that because I did see um, that there were. But please several. ask away, open to any questions. <laughs> um, yeah, so there were several. So it, it looks like, and forgive me, it looks like we had, you had from the state public charter authority, local government you discussed, and Department of Education. And not, we're not a money committee, but I know you, um, Mr. Yeah, Noble, I, had mentioned that there was no cost, and I just want to make sure that we're clear on the record. Well, I believe the charter, the the Department of Education, I believe theirs was a zero. Oh, it was the right. charter, but it was some of our smaller, our our other school districts, uh, such as Lander and um, Lyon and Carson, uh, Clark's is being removed, Douglas, and a few others. Which I'm attempt. I'm working with Mary Pajinski on addressing that and trying Wonderful. to clarify. And thank you, Assemblywoman Anderson. Um, I will just say um, thank you for bringing this bill. I had one of those moments that your students uh, were referring to uh, when I moved to Washington D.C. and went to the Smithsonian and saw um, an exhibit on Japanese internment camps and could not believe I had never heard of that. I literally just got goosebumps right then just thinking about it and quite frankly waited to hear more about it and learn more about it um, both in high school and college and that never came. So I, I, I think we all have one of those moments, right? And, um, and I really thank you for bringing this bill. With that, do we have any questions from the committee? Like quickly gonna make then a recommendation for you. Farewell to Manzanar. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, fictionalized book of a eighth grader experiencing being interned. Thank you. And I have done a lot of reading since that time, but I'm always looking for more things to read in my spare time, Assemblywoman Anderson. Maybe after, maybe in another 60 days. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you though. I appreciate that. Um, I see some hands up. Let's go ahead and get a, a cue if we have one. I see Assemblywoman Tolls, uh, I see Assemblywoman Hardy. Okay, let's start with that. Polls and then Hardy, go ahead. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, um, Assemblywoman Anderson, for bringing forward this bill and for bringing your students to help present with you. That's um, always a delight to have students in the committee presenting, and they all did an A-plus job. Um, so uh, one super quick question and then two um, more clarifying questions. Um, one is the reason that it doesn't have a fiscal note, I believe, because we've discussed this before, is it's contingent upon whenever the districts are going to be making their next adaptation of new learning materials, including textbooks. Therefore, it's it, it's not mandated that it's within a certain time frame, which then would come with a fiscal note. It's rather that whenever they will be up, upgrading, then that that's when they'll be making these considerations. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you for saying it so much better than I did. That's absolutely it. But I just want to make sure I got that clear for my own sake and for the record. And um, and this is perfect timing because we had just talked about on Tuesday the um, content standards specifically with social studies. So I happen to have them in my lap still. Um, don't worry, they haven't been in my lap the whole time since Tuesday, but they're, <laughs> they're easily accessible. So right now we do have multicultural band um, within social studies that includes diverse contributions made by men and women from various racial and ethnic backgrounds, including without limitation information relating to contributions and impact. And I just want to make sure that I'm clear that really the intent of bringing forward this legislation is that you want to further delineate very specifically what, what we mean in those um, broader categories. Uh, through Chair Bill Bray Axelrod to your Assembly Member Tolls, thank you for the question. Absolutely, that's exactly it. Um, I, I believe that the uh, current strand of social studies is very clearly done with the multicultural points of view. It is not always that way in the humanities, which would be the uh, English, which is my world, as well as, or literature, as well as the arts. And so that's another area to bring it in. And then also you'll notice that it also has the sciences. And so that would be health and science. And so it's another opportunity for us to show that um, multicultural idea, ideas and things to study should not just be one subject. It is in all of the subjects that we have. It doesn't mean like every single, you know, every lesson we'll have to have something with it. But there should be something that shows a multicultural point of view every year that we're in school. And it's not just a social studies issue. It's, it's an every subject item. At this time, I'm only concentrating on sciences, humanities, and social studies. Thank you for that. And then, Madam Chair, one last question, if I may, just a practical implementation. Go ahead. And, and uh, Assemblywoman Woman Anderson, you can go directly to the committee members. Thank you. Thank you. And then, um, so it, it, it does, it is very restrictive in section two, subsection three, that um, instructional materials must not be selected um, unless they include all these categories from section one. And I just wonder if we can get some dialogue on the record of how do we avoid a situation where we, you know, we're ready to adopt new textbooks in two years and we look, we go out there to all the various publications and we find that we're like, we're 80 percent there but there there might be missing um a couple of these delineated points my fear is then we would be stuck with the textbooks that we have today because according to this language we're not allowed to adopt a new textbook until we find one that meets this this category could you just um help how do we help keep that from happening thank you uh, and Assembly Member Anderson, thank you, Assembly Member Tolls, for bringing that up. I uh, I really appreciate the question. So I'm going to first do a stab at it, and then I believe the Department of Education. I don't know if I can phone a friend or not on this, uh, but I'm going to try um, because talking with them, the process is first they look through all the textbooks, you know that that would be uh, considered, and then they're able to recommend a group of textbooks to the school districts for that con that further consideration. They do not take every single like it does not always have to have, for example, Basque. Let's let's admit it. The Basque culture is something that's very important to the state of Nevada. 
is not exactly going to be something that you hear a lot often about in Illinois. Um, so it's that sort of item of it should have, if it is being utilized, that it's accurately depicted. It's not something that's just kind of thrown out there and inaccurately portrayed. So that's the first thing. The second thing, though, is we do not want to get into that, that I guess, um, quagmire, or I guess, for lack of a better term, conflict of not having a textbook that's up to date because it does not fit all these items. Instead, it has to deal with the word accurately portrays, and that's where that's coming from. So I wanted to make sure, does that clarify the question? And then I didn't know, although I know the Department of Education is not weighing in on this, I believe they are weighing in uh, or they're watching if uh, the chair wanted to ask them as well for that clarification. I would respect either way that you would like. Yes, we can actually do that. We do have a uh, Department of Ed on, so if we'd like to go ahead, that would be great. If they would like to, <laughs> I believe they would. I think Ms. Gonzalez, are you still available? Or someone else? Oh, here we go. Oh, thank you, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Moore, uh, Deputy Superintendent, Nevada Department of Education for the record. Um, Assemblywoman Anderson is correct. Um, while even in our best efforts to find uh, a comprehensive curriculum, um, there are often uh, gaps that still exist where school districts will often supplement um, the curriculum. Um, and so to the Assemblywoman's point about ensuring accurate depiction, that is certainly something um, that can be um, done um, in the review and vetting of materials, recognizing um, that if there is a need to enhance the curriculum um, across other populations or groups, um, or just other aspects uh, that there is room for supplemental curriculum um, and districts do employ that currently. Well, thank you both so much. Thank you. And I believe uh, Assemblywoman Hardy, you had a question? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so my questions kind of just go along with what Assemblywoman, uh, Assemblywoman Tolls just asked. So, and just to help me understand how this whole process is done, so it says that the bill applies to the next instructional material adoption. And then it also says in section two sub three instructional materials, including without limitation, a textbook textbook. So my understanding is like teachers now don't use textbooks a lot. Um, I can remember even when my kids were in school, they had, you know, some textbooks in the classroom and things like that. But a lot of things they had workbooks or other supplemental materials. So if you could kind of just, what what's like a time frame? How often do they ad adopt materials? You know, if it's for moving away from textbooks and is it like supplemental reading books? Is it online instruction? Like kind of give me a little more information how you see that. Thank you for the, the question, Assembly Member Hardy, uh, Nathan Anderson for the record. Um, first of all, thank you so really thank you because I was like over the top, like looking for as many supplemental things as I could find. And so uh, I actually pulled up my my world of education, as, you, as many of you know, I'm an English teacher. So I looked for um, our supplementally approved literature list in the Washoe County School District. And so that's kind of what I'm talking about is that the supplemental titles are actually, if they are adopted by a whole district or even by a state, that they satisfy and accurately depict these items. So for example, Night by, again, which I've already mentioned by uh, Eli Weissel, that accurately depicts his world because it's, it is a biography of his experience. But the other one is, could be, um, uh, there's one that, uh, Long Walk, A Long Walk Gone, which is um, a again a nonfiction story about a child soldier in the Rwanda uh, conflict, and so it's those sort of items is what I'm talking about when it comes to the instructional materials, and that's only when they are district wide or statewide adopted. It is not the items that the uh, that a teacher is bringing in on their own. This is when a school district or the state has said this is what's going to happen. The process for the adoption of the textbooks, they go through a review a certain number of years, every three to five years, I believe, 
Um, when I spoke with the Department of Education, the social studies are up right now. They're in the process of trying to find the right, the, the best and most accurate textbooks at this time. Um, they'll be doing real language next, and then they'll be reviewing ELA or English language arts in the spring, followed by computer sciences. So, and then followed by math and then followed by health. And so there's a continual review of this process. When it comes to the textbooks adoptions, as well as the supplementally adopted materials, that many times it is defined more by money. And as you just stated, unfortunately, many of the schools are not able to afford these new textbooks. But if there are textbooks that are coming forward, they need to satisfy this is kind of the process that that I have have envisioned and, and talked about with others. Thank you very that much. That's very helpful to understand how often it's done is like we're talking about textbooks for every class. They're trying to go through them all at once. So I really appreciate that. And then explaining, you know, the supplemental materials and what would be included and, and what isn't. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Assemblywoman Hardy, and I can testify that I have never seen my daughter have a single textbook. Um, so yes, I think um, we're we're kind of she does also doesn't know what a chalkboard is either. So there's that. <laughs> um, are there any other questions from the committee? Okay, with that we will move on to the phone lines and see if there are calls in support of AB two six one BPS. To amplify in support of Assembly Bill 261, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 577, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Chris Bailey, D-A-L-Y, Nevada State Education Association, the voice of Nevada educators for over 120 years. NSCA supports AB 261 to provide diversity and inclusivity in the academic standards and curriculum. NSCA has had a standing position in support of diversity in education materials since 1978 with a resolution adopted at our member delegate assembly. This position was affirmed and expanded in 1990 and 2002 states the Nevada State Education Association believes that educational materials, textbooks, reference materials, audiovisual materials, supplementary reading, and all subjects should portray our cultural diversity and the achievements of minority groups and women. NSCA supports continued firm stands by the Department of Education Textbook Commission and local school districts to test and adapt curricular content, which recognizes the contributions to society of minority, ethnic, and cultural diversity. NSCA also supports the development of attitudes in Nevada youth, which further these beliefs. Not 1978, it's long past time for Nevada to pass a law to ensure diversity and inclusivity in our curriculum and instructional materials. Educators know when curriculum and materials include diverse points of view, it doesn't just develop empathy and understanding, it actually helps give students from a diversity of backgrounds, representation, and a voice. That's why educators across the state and country have renewed their focus on developing culturally responsible classrooms oftentimes spinning out of pocket to supplemental, supplement old instruction materials that are out of date and provide limited perspectives. We would like to acknowledge Natha Anderson, classroom teacher, past president of the Washoe Education Association, now assembly member for listening to educators and bringing this important and timely legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Daly. Um, next call in support. Caller with the last three digits of four. Four, seven. Please press star six to unmute. You will have two minutes. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record and you may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Melanie Willingham Jaggers. That's M-E-L-A-N-I-E-W-I-L-L-I-N-G-H-A-M hyphen J-A-G-G-E-R-S. I am the executive director of GLSEN. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony before the Committee of Education. Um, the GLSEN is a national leading organization on LGBTQ plus issues in K through 12 education that seeks to advance um, racial, gender, and disability justice in communities across the country. We believe that all students deserve a safe and affirming school environment, regardless of their actual uh, or perceived sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. Based on the extensive research that GLSEN has conducted regarding the experiences of LGBTQ plus students in K through 12 learning communities, especially our research on positive impacts 
on inclusive school curriculum, we strongly support uh, Assembly Bill 261. I want to share our deepest thanks to Assemblywoman Anderson for bringing this important bill forward in collaboration with advocates from here in Nevada. Inclusive curriculum is one of the four core supports that GLSEN's decades of research has identified as improving school climates for LGBTQ plus students. As Assembly Member Anderson said, and we agree, curriculum can be a mirror that reflects students and their experiences back to themselves. And it can also be a window that gives students the opportunity to understand the experiences and perspectives of people who have different identities and lived experiences than their own. This is reflected by the most recent findings of our biennial National School Climate Survey. LGBTQ plus students attending school where positive representation of LGBTQ plus topics were a part of the curriculum heard fewer homophobic and transphobic remarks and, and reported less severe victimization at school based on their sexual orientation and gender identity as compared to students whose school did not uh, expose them to, exclusive, uh, to inclusive curriculum. Our vision is that we can work together to transform schools so that they can be places of liberation where all students can thrive and reach their full potential. To better serve LGBTQ plus students and ultimately all of our students, we urge you to vote in favor of this critically important legislation. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you so much for your call and support. Next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 013. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Uh, thank you, committee. My name is Lauren Zita Santos, Lauren Zita, L-O-R-E-N-Z-I-T-A, Santos, S-A-N-T-O-S, and I'm the outreach coordinator for One API in Nevada. I'm a second generation Filipino American and my family moved to Las Vegas when I was five years old. Despite the AAPI community currently making up 10% of Nevada's overall population, growing up, I never saw their contributions in textbooks. Nevada's history has been built off the work of AAPI immigrants. Chinese immigrants built the railroads that connected the West to Nevada. And despite that, in 1878 and 1908, Chinatowns in Reno were burnt down. Along with what happened to the Chinese community, I'm glad that the chair brought up her experience learning about Japanese internment in the Smithsonian Museum, because in 1934, the first gambling hall in Reno was owned by Japanese families. However, due to Japanese internment, their property was taken away from them. The AAPI community has been exploited and overlooked throughout history. Currently, the curriculum does not showcase Nevada's rich AAPI history. AB 261 is a long overdue bill that will ensure that the AAPI community is properly represented in schools. Thank you. Thank you so much for your call. Next caller in support. Caller with the last three digits of 376. Please press star six to unmute. You will have two minutes. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record and you may begin. My name is Luann Tiller, L-U-A-N-N-P-I-L-L-A-R. I work for the ACLU of Nevada as the Administrative and Program Manager, and I'm also the mom of two students from Nevada Public Schools. AB 261 is a bill to ensure diversity and inclusion will be added to our school's curriculum. One of school's primary purposes is to help children move from dependency on adults to becoming independent people capable of making judgments and decisions about their society because school serves as one of the primary providers of this role, it is incumbent upon government to ensure our students are prepared to make those decisions in a knowledgeable manner. Yet, education of K-12 students often leaves out the history and the contributions of many cultures and groups of our society, such as Native Americans, persons from various ethnic, racial, and socioeconomic backgrounds, differing gender identity and different abilities. This knowledge is imperative, however, to making wise decisions to further democracy in our state. Whether they are voting, lobbying, or even legislating, Nevada students should grow up to make decisions that thoughtfully considers the history of all of the people that helped to build our community. While the Department of Ed currently considers diverse cultural points of view when making curriculum decisions, 
It is not required by Nevada state law, and therefore it is subject to inconsistent or piecemeal implementation and even potential backtracking with changed leadership. Therefore, we urge you to pass AB 261. Thank you. Thank you for the call. Are there any other callers in support? Caller with the last three digits of 904. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chell, Chair um, and members of the committee. My name is Alex, A-E-L-X, Canberra, C-A-M as in Mary, B as in Boy, E-R as in Romeo, O-S. And today I'm speaking on behalf of Battleborn Progress, or a nonpartisan organization in Nevada to ensure fairness and an equal opportunity to succeed for all Nevadans. We are speaking in support of AB 261. Current state law does not require school districts to include culturally diverse instructional, instructional materials. Our K-12 students don't always see themselves represented in science, art, history, literature, or social studies. As a CCSD graduate and as someone who tutors my siblings who are current CCSD students, I can, work, I can recall with firsthand experience that people like us, that is Mexican American or Central American people, are not well represented in the course curriculum. The times that we are, it's done through a Western ethnographic lens without proper cultural nuance or citation. AB 261 would require future instructional materials adopted throughout the state to include not just my community, Latinx ethnic backgrounds, but also the groups that uh, the Assemblywoman Anderson mentioned previously. Um, AB 261 would allow us to better represent the cultural diversity, achievements, and legacies of all communities in Nevada and show them that home does mean Nevada. We'd like to thank and express our gratitude to, them, to the Assemblywoman Anderson, Miller, and Considine for their leadership on this issue. Thank you. Thank you so much for the call. Next caller in support. Caller with the last three digits of 759, please press star six to unmute. You will have two minutes. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record and you may begin. For the record, my name is Haley Lindsley, H-A-I-L-E-Y-L-I-N-D-S-L-E-Y. I'm an organizer with Planned Parenthood and a community member. Planned Parenthood Votes Nevada supports AB 261 because we understand the positive impact that a complete education can have on students as they learn about their country and those that have made it what it is today. Ensuring that students in the state of Nevada receive a complete education, one that includes the myriad contributions of different groups, including Black, Indigenous, people of color, the LGBTQ plus community, and women have had on the history of the United States should be the baseline. Too often, textbooks leave out the contribution and roles of marginalized groups in history. We look forward to living in a state that instead requires and uplifts a comprehensive understanding of American and world history. Please support AB 261. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the call. Next caller in support. Caller with the last three digits of 672. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Hello, my name is Teresa Melendez. Teresa, T-E-R-E-S-A, Melendez, M-E-L-E-N-D-E-Z. And uh, I am a community mem member from Northern Nevada. I'm a, and I'm, I'm a mother of three students in the uh, Nevada, Nevada public school system, and I'm a, I'm a college and career coach and educational consultant. And um, thank you, um, Assemblywoman Natha Anderson, for carrying this bill. It's incredibly important. There are three, three issues I, I wanted to hit on why this bill is so important to communities of color and communities that are often underrepresented in um, our curriculum and in the K-12 system. One, we've heard from some really courageous and thoughtful presenter, or, you know, folks giving testimony today. We know that when students are represented in the curriculum, that they perform better. That's research-based, that's pretty basic, we know that. We know that our current curriculum, K through 12 curriculum in um, Nevada, 
does is is very much presented from a white perspective, a white lens, and um, communities of color, um, communities um, LGBTQ community, and um, those of um, the 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 fringes are often either misrepresented or not represented. Oftentimes we hear, because I, I come from the Native community, I, I sit and I listen to the lessons that my children participate in um, around Indigenous communities and the information is inaccurate. So not only is it um, not representative, it's inaccurate, sometimes racist, often harmful. Second, it would be such a benefit to teachers to have <laughs> appropriate, accurate curriculum. So um, working in the school system, it's such an extra burden for teachers to go out and try to find curriculum that's accurate, and then they already are overburdened, overcommitted. Third thing, this is what we need as a country. So as a community member that's often educating folks about Indigenous issues, I'm educating adults. Uh, I'm educating business people and legislatures. But these are things that we as Americans need to have learned in our K-12 through system so we can function better in our roles as American citizens, as Nevadans, as legislators, as lawyers, as educators. Thank you for your time. Thank you for this bill. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for the call. Next caller in support. For those who have just joined to testify in support on Assembly Bill 261, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 085, please please go slowly state and spell your name for the record. You all have two minutes and may begin. Hello, for the record, my name is Alyssa Cortez, A-L-Y-S-S-A, -S -S Cortez, C-O-R-T-E-S. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. I am the Program Associate for Silver State Equality, a statewide LGBTQ plus civil rights organization and we are in full support of AB 261. AB 261 would ensure diverse perspectives from historically underrepresented groups are taught to the children in our communities. There is a well-established correlation between diverse representation, 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 sorry about that, and student success. I was born and raised in Nevada and attended CCSD schools from K through 12. I'm also the daughter of immigrants, a woman of color, and a member of the LGBTQ community. And I know this would positively, positively impact the students in our state because it not only prepares them for their future, but it will also allow them to feel seen and represented. That's why Silver State Equality supports AB 261, and we respectfully urge you to do so as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any other callers in support? To testify in support on Assembly Bill 261, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 159, please press star six to unmute. You will have two minutes. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record, and you may be. Hello, my name is Amy Holdridge, A-I-M-E-E, -E, Holdridge, H-O-L-D-R-E-D-G-E. -E. I am the Racial Justice Committee Chair for Las Vegas CSA and a parent of two children here in Nevada who are in CCSD. Thank you, committee members, for allowing me to speak. Um, just very quickly, this bill is so important. I am a woman of color, um, and it's it would be a beautiful thing to not have to constantly supplement my children's education through CCSD um, with accurate and and true and meaningful histories of um, all the diverse people we have in this country, um, let alone our indigenous peoples. I was recently driving up on the 93 through Nevada to go to Great Basin, and I wanted to know the history of those lands, not of the miners, not of the settlers, not of the explorers, most of whom were white men, but of the tribes that have probably named everything beautifully, <laughs> which would also inspire 
so much in my children and myself. Um, I would like to hear from our queer Nevadans, our our Black Nevadans, everyone. It it I, I think it it feels a little silly that that we have to. Um, talk about the importance of a bill like this um and thank you again assemblywoman um anderson for 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 bringing it um but I, it is imperative that if we want our children to feel connected and engaged and committed to our state as well as our country they have to see themselves in its history and its teaching and their education and so that's why i'm in support of of AB 261. Thank you for letting me speak today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the testimony. Are there any other callers in support? Sure, the line is open and working. However, there are no more callers in support of Assembly Bill 261 at this time. Thank you. And with that, we will close the testimony in support and move on to testimony in opposition. To testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 261, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once again, to testify in opposition, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. There we go. Caller with the last three digits of 137, please press star six to unmute. You will have two minutes. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record and you may begin. Good afternoon. This is Brandy Harrison for the record. Uh, I am in opposition of the bill because I would like some amendments included in the bill to make it more viable. Uh, the bill makes, uh, well, the bill needs to make the delineation between the different black groups in Nevada. That's imperative that not only adults, but our children know that descendants of slaves are a unique group in America. Descendants of slaves do not share the same culture as black Caribbeans or people who identify as African American or black on the African continent. People coming from the African continent did not endure brutal chattel slavery here in the United States. Therefore, uh, in section one, please specifically include United States descendants of chattel slavery or freedmen in that section. Also, uh, the bill includes education on sexual orientation and gender identity for kindergarten um, or elementary students. What are the specific details or learning objectives our elementary students will learn? How in-depth will sexual orientation explore? I like this section explained more or removed from the bill, uh, or if there could be some physiological evidence that points to the need for five or six or seven year olds to learn about um, sex in that way. So that would be an area of concern. And if we could get more opinions from parents uh, regarding their opinion of uh, what they what they want their small children to be learning about sex, um, it would be a more uh, comprehensive bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony in opposition. Um, do we have any other callers in opposition? Sure, the line is open and working. However, there are no more callers in opposition of Assembly Bill 261 at this time. Thank you for that, BPS. I will close the testimony in opposition and open it up to testimony in neutral for AB 261. Yeah, at this time, the line is open and working. However, there are no callers in the queue to testify in neutral on Assembly Bill 261. Thank you, BPS, for that. And so we will close the testimony in neutral and I will invite the bill sponsor, see if she would like to come to virtually come up and say some closing remarks. 
I would just like to thank the committee and, and again, Chair, for bringing this forward so quickly. And I am actually going to close it with a uh, personal story. Um, I was thinking that this, the importance of us talking about our diversity as a state would be something that was only that should be in our textbooks and should be uh, something that we do as educators and also in our families. This came home to me big time last, just a few weeks ago, two weeks ago exactly. I uh, gave my nephew one of these fun little things that are at all of our favorite shops, which would be known as the Nevada State Legislature gift shop. And so his birthday present this year was the uh, Nevada trivia. And he called me the next day and told me that it was whack and it was weird and there's no way this was accurate. And I said, okay, well, why is that? And it was the question of name the first Nevada casino to allow black and white people to mingle on the casino floor. For those of you that don't know, it's the Moulin Rouge. But um, the reason why he felt that was so weird is he really did believe that this was something that only happened in other states. And it just, it come, brings home how important it is for us all to talk about the diversity and how far we have come as a state, but more importantly, how much further we must go. So thank you so much for this opportunity and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman Anderson. And with that, I will close the hearing on AB 261 and get to our last agenda item. I thank the committee members um, for powering through. I know next week's gonna be worse, but I really appreciate all the thoughtful questions and everything. So last agenda item is public comment. Before we go to that agenda item, I'd like to remind those present that the period for public comment is an opportunity to discuss general matters that fall within the purview of this committee. We're not rehearing any bills that we've already listened to. Please remember to clearly state and spell your name and listen. limit your comments to two minutes. BPS, do we have any callers on the line for public comment? To provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Here. The line is open and working. However, we have no callers for public comment at this time. Thank you very much. BPS, do we have any announcements from members of the committee before we adjourn? I am not seeing any. So with that, our next meeting will be Tuesday, April 6 at 1 p.m. We will recess and then we're gonna come back at six. Yay! <laughs> so we will see you then. Meeting is adjourned.